in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. If you're thinking what happened to chapter 1, you can go back and listen. It's uh, there online. It's on the app. Uh, been a fantastic book. Let's pray and I'll, I'll get into it. But Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as we head into, uh, well, in many ways, the problem church of the early churches. What a joy it is to know, Lord, you love these people. And there are things you mentioned to them you didn't mention to other churches who did not appear to have the same kind of problems. So what a great reminder of the love of God. And I pray as we open 2 Corinthians, we continue in it, that, Lord, it truly would sharpen our faith, our walk. And in many ways, Lord, as we're in the midst of a generation that really is ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth, that, Lord, it would strengthen us. And so work through your word, Lord, by the Holy Spirit. Touch every heart that's here. And thank you for your great faithfulness in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're visiting, the good news is you're going to be just as trying to catch up as the rest of everybody around you. Uh, if you're not visiting, you've been with us on Wednesday nights, you know that um, two weeks ago I did the introduction, why is Corinth so important? We show you the map of how they sail, the, the point of trade. All that stuff is there, and I encourage you to go back and listen. But I had said pretty candidly, when I was going to the Bible college and I went through Corinthians, I'm like, man, these are so long, all these chapters. i got to write papers on it. I'm like, ah, you know. And then decades of ministry have passed. And now, with decades of ministry, I am so grateful for these two letters that we have because it really, in many ways, shows you the heart of God. And it helps you if you're dealing with ministry, practical wisdom, I mean, just to give you an idea, right, he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I hear there are contentions among you from those of the household of Chloe. I believe it. People are saying, you know, Apollos is my favorite teacher. I like Paul. I like Peter. They're all divided. They're backbiting about it. He's having to deal with that. We get to chapter 5. Go ahead and turn there because we're going to need that today. Chapter 5. <laughs> you don't need daytime soaps, man. You just need to read your Bible. It says, chapter 5, it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you. And such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles. Wait a second, I got to explain. If you go back and listen, you'll learn that Corinth is a town that has a four and a half mile wide isthmus. Boats come, they drag them across the isthmus, put them back there from the Aegean to the Adriatic. So people have time on their hands. A lot of wealth because of trade. There's the temple of Aphrodite. We'll talk about that. A thousand temple prostitutes go out by night and service the worshipers. There's the temple of Apollos where the male worshipers service the males who want to engage in those behaviors. It is a town that is obsessed with three things. One, sports, because they have every two years something called the Asmithian Games, second only to the Olympics. Second thing they're obsessed with, sex. Look at their history. Third thing they're obsessed with, which Paul had to call out in chapter 6, suing each other. Now, I know it's hard to imagine a society that is obsessed with sports, sex, and lawsuits. I know you're thinking, how's that relate to today? But that was the culture. And so he's been calling these things out. He gets to chapter 11, right? Chapter 7, marriage issues, what if I'm saved and they're not? Chapter 11 gets there and he says, you guys are having your, your agape feasts, your potluck, basically. And some people are coming drunk to the potluck. How's that for a different church? They put out the food. Those who are doing well, they push others out of the way who are in trouble or impoverished to get their food first, leaving the people who are challenged for food with nothing. He's basically saying, but what are you doing? Over and over, he's saying to his church, what are you doing? Gets into gifts of the Spirit. Great, you have a gift of the Spirit, but it's not supposed to be drawing attention to you. It's supposed to be drawing attention to God. You know, this, is, this is the whole thing he's been through. Things I never really realized. This church with all these problems, twice he talks about God rewarding them. How's that for an encouragement? I mean, they're like the poster children for don't do this. And yet he's talking about how God will reward them. Talks about how God has many people in that city. So it's a great book, in case you didn't get that sense. And so now we'll pick up. I'm going to just remind you, get a running start. Chapter 1, verse 1. 
2 Corinthians, go back, listen to the other two weeks, it'll make a lot of sense. In other words, hang on for 24 verses and we'll be good. Paul, apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Talk about all that. Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, in spite of all their mess, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia, that's southern Greece, grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. He goes all through in chapter 1 about comfort, comforting, and being comforted. God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. Why? That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. What does that mean? The trials you go through or so you can learn about God's faithfulness and then help others who feel like he has left them. You mean there's a reason for the nonsense I go through? Absolutely. But you have to go back and listen to get that in more detail. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. We go through this fallen world and we find him helping us. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your comfort or consolation and salvation which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. You're not the only one. This has been through history. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. For our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, this world, so shall you also be of the consolation, the comfort that comes directly from God when you seek him. For we would not, brethren... Have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that's Turkey to us, Asia Minor, that we were pressed out of measure, you thought that was only you, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. This is Paul the Apostle. Jesus appeared to him at least twice, if not three times, Athens, or on the road to Damascus, in Corinth, and also in Jerusalem. And he's so down, he despairs of life. In other words, he's a human being just like you and I. We went all through that two weeks ago. What happens when we're down? We talked about different prophets who are ready to basically like, just take my life. Take my life. I'm done. But you have to go back and listen for that. We had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust, that he will yet deliver us. Faith increases, by the way, through trials. We covered that two weeks ago. You also helping together by prayer for us, that the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, that thanks may be given by many on our behalf. So verse 12, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, which the church keeps falling into in the present, but by the grace of God, we've had our conversation or manner of living in the world and more abundantly to you word. We write none other things unto you than that what you have read or acknowledge, and I trust you shall acknowledge even to the end. Talked about that last week. As also we've acknowledged, you have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. For in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before, that you might have a second benefit, in the past by you into Macedonia, northern Greece, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. There are two ports. You'll learn about that in the first week. He would often sail out of Centuria on the Aegean Sea towards Israel. When I therefore was thus minded with these plans, did I use lightness? Were the things that I purposed, do I purpose according to the flesh? That with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay. In other words, can you not trust what I say? credibility issue. But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yes and no, but in him was yes or yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea. Here's a promise we need to watch out for. How many have heard of the G20? Okay, how many have heard of the G7? Okay, we're going to eventually see what will essentially be the G10. What do you mean? 
Nebuchadnezzar's dream of that giant statue in the last days before God sets up his kingdom, there will be ten toes, ten kingdoms, partly weak, partly strong. With what's going on in the world, how many saw, by the way, the pressure is starting to go to Ukraine to make peace with, with uh, Russia? How many have caught that? Some of that's in the works now. What we should expect to see is 10 major power brokers essentially dominating the world scene. We have a G7, a G20, it's gonna consolidate in some way, shape, or form. When we see that these are essentially running world policy, it is in those days that suddenly an antichrist is going to rise. The antichrist rises as Israel is dealing with constant wars with their enemies, and it suggests or brings forth a peace agreement that allows suddenly Israel to peaceably restore and rebuild a third temple. So from a world politic point of view, one of the things you should be watching out for is a realigning of nations through these different wars that are going on. And then comes that stone without human hands who will set up his kingdom. All the promises of God in him are yes, and in him are amen, and to the glory of God by us, now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. We talked about this last week. Who has also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. So we talked last week about demonic possession, being sealed by the Spirit. You can go back and listen. We covered it last week. Moreover, I call God for a record or a witness upon my soul that to spare you, I came not as yet unto Corinth. If you read the first letter, you know there's problems. And he said he's going to show up and sort them out if he had to. So to spare you, I came not as yet unto Corinth, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. Now we pick up chapter 2, verse 1. Welcome, everybody, to your new Sunday morning. But I determined this with myself that I would not come again, note that he's had some painful visits, to you in heaviness. The word there is lupe, try it. Lupe, noun, grief, trouble, heaviness, or sorrow. We will also encounter the ver verb lupeo, welcome to New Testament Greek. Lupeo, to experience grief, trouble, or sorrow. And lupe and lupe are used quite a bit through these next few verses, which means they've had a lot of grief, trouble, or sorrow, good. I determined, by the way, the Greek is easier to say in the Hebrew. <laughs> You'll see. I determined again not to come to you in grief, trouble, sorrow, or heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me. Constant conflict will do damage to a relationship. Who you guys just all went through Thanksgiving? <laughs> You know what I mean about family dynamics. Some things you realize, zip it, let it go. If you have, and please hear my heart, if, if you've not been able, whether you've never been married or not able to bear children, please hear my heart, I am truly sorry. For some people that is their reality. If you have been allowed one way or the other, through biological means or adoption or whatever, fostering, to parent children at some level. You really begin to get quite the education about a father or a mother's heart. For example, or even grandkids, anybody notice that it's Christmas time soon? Anybody? Can anybody find a parking spot? Or, you know, you go in and like all the displays and... You know, Home Depot goes from ho, ho, to ho, ho, like all in a day. Like, wow, that was weird. Halloween's out. And... and you sit there in the aisle and you go, hmm, razor sharp buck knife. Well, Jimmy is three years of age now. Shall I get it for him? <laughs> How many are able to figure that out? Is your kid or your grandkid like, yeah, probably not a good idea to give Jimmy the razor sharp buck knife because he's not ready for it. You see, now you begin to understand the heart of a father or a mother. There are things that God would like to do in our lives, but some things you're not ready for. We'll get into that a little more as we work our way through here. So, out of much affliction, I wrote to you. 
But I determined I would not come again making you sorry and heaviness, right? How could I do that? One thing we've also learned as you get into this is beware over-parenting, especially as you get adult children. They know where to find you if they want an opinion. But watch out for that one too, because sometimes it's not going to get anywhere. I would not come to you again in heaviness, verse 2, for if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad but the same which is made sorry by me? So I wrote this same unto you, that last epistle, lest when I come I should have sorrow of them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that they would do the right thing. Did we read 1 Corinthians 5? Did we? Did we read when he said you'd have to leave the planet, not the company of fornicators? Am I the only one? How many say yes? How many say no? See, first service is blending together. He wrote to them to take... So, no, let's go back and read it. Just go back. Just easier. Did I already read it? Somebody tell me. Good. Okay, great. Now let's read it. It's reported commonly. We've talked about this. We read this? No. no. Good. We've got to read this. Welcome to second service. I'm joining you as we speak. It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles. This is Corinth, where they're really off the chain. That one should have his father's wife. Somebody has an affair with their stepmother. And you are puffed up, you've not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For verily as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, I've judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. That in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, I'm with you in spirit, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. In other words, if you're going to keep this going, you got to leave. But note this, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's interesting. Go back and listen. Your glorying is not good, Know you not that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? A little corruption will spread if you don't deal with it. So purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So I wrote unto you in an epistle, which we don't have, by the way, not to keep company with fornicators, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or the extortioners or with idolaters. For then you must needs go out of the world. You'd have to leave the planet. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man or woman, brother or sister, be called a brother and they be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such a one, don't even eat. No, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without out in the world? Do you not judge them that are within, within the church? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Great. Now back to Corinthians. So when I wrote to you out of much affliction, I wrote having confidence in you all, what? To do the right thing. This guy can't stay in the middle of the church having an affair with his stepmother He's got to go. So they said, you got to go. When you have to deliver some painful news, a you got to go, or a painful rebuke, one of the things I've done when I've had to go through something like this is, number one, you pray, right? And you write down what's the problem. And then you take time to pray over writing down what the problem is. And then when you get your chance to speak to that person of what the problem is, my encouragement to you is stay on what you wrote down because you won't say more than you should and you won't also be able to wimp out and not say what you really need to say. And sometimes when I've had to deal with this with folks, I have actually read what I had to say to them, to them on my knees because what I have to say is not hard to receive. You guys think I play golf all week. I don't play golf. 
I have meetings sometimes where the staff upstairs has to leave the upstairs because it's so loud with the couple I'm sitting with. It's hard sometimes to, have to deliver some pretty solid truth. But if you can deliver it in a way they know you're not sitting there like you're better than they are and everything else, and you're saying what you gotta say, and listen, if you guys don't get this right, it's gonna blow you up. Sometimes they actually hear you. So Paul wrote to them. He told them, this guy's gotta go. And he said, I have confidence in you all, what? That they would wake up and realize, we're allowing something that is gonna corrupt the rest of the church. This guy's gotta go. And so they did indeed do what he asked. I wrote unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow of them of whom I ought to rejoice. Verse 3, I had confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears. Not that you should be grieved, the rebuke he gave them, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. What do you mean love? You're rebuking me and you love me? back to the little kid with the buck knife. If there are things in your walk with God that God cannot bless, then in many ways by walking in rebellion or what I see a lot in this generation, having God on your terms, well, he doesn't really mean that, or things have changed. Here's the biggie they love. God knows our hearts. Yes, he does. And in Jeremiah, he said they're desperately wicked. But when you decide to walk in your own direction before God, doing what you know is wrong before him, why would you expect him to bless you? Well, now you're a prosperity ministry. No, parent-child relationship. It's really very simple when you learn that aspect of human life. He's a good father in heaven. He said, if you fathers being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Luke 11, 11. So when you have people that have decided to have God on their own terms and you take the courage in prayer to go and say to them, hey, this is out of order, it's often not well received. But the heart behind it is this has got to be getting in your way of your walk with God and the desire he has to work in your life. And sadly, because there is such a falling away going on within the church, which is a sign of the last days, you can church shop and you'll find churches that say, that's totally fine. And that's why if you've been paying attention, there are, among some denominations, many churches now leaving some different denominations because they have decided to compromise on the fact that if you're engaged in homosexual practices, you need to repent. They don't want to talk about it. But if you're engaged in heterosexual practices outside of marriage, you need to repent just as much as the people in the homosexual behaviors outside of marriage. So whether you're in an affair, you're in adultery, you're fornicating as a single person, or you're in the gay lifestyle as whatever, the fact is all three flavors, if you want to have a place in heaven, you need to repent. And they don't want to preach that. Because they don't want to deliver the truth. And so people are living in a compromise and soon the Lord's going to remove his church. Now, where's the love in that? I wrote these things to you. Boy, it's quiet in here. I wrote these things unto you that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. That's why I shot you straight. By the way, Paul likes to make his own words. More abundantly is literally exceeding super abundantly. Try it. Honey, do you love me? Baby, I'm exceeding super abundantly. In the Greek, that's perisoteros. Good luck with that one. So verse 5, now we pick up with what he had to write in 1 Corinthians. If any has caused grief, that's the guy in chapter 5 who was having an affair with his stepmom. If any has caused grief, he has not grieved me. Wait a second. Verse 5, let's point out the most simple thing. What did he not mention? His name. How many caught that? He didn't mention his name. There's one place, 1 Timothy 3, where if an elder sins, then you bring before the congregation on some issues that others might fear. I have seen churches, we don't, but I have seen churches where someone is caught up in a, an affair or a problem or whatever it may be, 
that have actually from the pulpit or even brought up to the pulpit people and have basically declared this is what they're doing and we're throwing them out. I've seen it split churches. I've seen it engender lawsuits. And yet the only place is in the case of an elder who is doing something that's off the chain. He doesn't even say his name. He's just dealing with the issue. And yet, if you read 2 Timothy, as Paul's getting near the end of his ministry, he mentions a couple of guys, Phygelus and Hermogenes, and he makes it clear by name they've turned away, departed from the faith. In other words, watch out for them. He deals also with uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus, and there he talks about their teaching bad teaching. And he warns Timothy, he says, look, watch out for Alexander the coppersmith, man, he'll mess you up. So there's a place where he'll name names. But in this case, with someone who takes a misstep, gets into an affair, happens to be a stepmother, no name is given. That's really interesting. If any has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but in part. In other words, I'm out here watching you guys have to deal with it. I've only had a small share. That I may not overcharge you all. Verse 6, sufficient to such a man. Interesting, that was also how he's described in chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Deliver such a one. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. What punishment? You got to go. And no, I won't get lunch with you. And that brought conviction. How many have heard of the uh, parable or the story of the prodigal son? Three, four, five years. Uh, Luke 15. One of the most important statements in that story is where it says the prodigal son came to himself. That's everything. You see, until someone comes to themselves and realizes what their behavior is doing, you're often just wasting your breath. I've done that. I've had times where people caught up in affairs or other things, try to share, you know, share with them, hey, hey, what's going on? And they're like, la, 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 I'm not listening. And they'll say things like, yeah, but things are good. I had this said to me once. Let me see how you take it. One guy said to me, my wife is my Leah, but this girl at work I'm in the affair with, she's my Rachel. See, I'm not the only one. I'm like, wow, are you deceived. Here's the worst thing. Satan loves to deceive. But you're really helpless when he's gotten you to self-deceive. Well, things have changed. God understands my heart. Well, some people see that differently. And boom, now you're living in a place where God can not only not bless your life, but he has to correct your life. You've heard the old saying, check yourself before you wreck yourself. So here he says, listen, you guys actually did what I asked. You told them to leave. Nobody got lunch with them. So thankfully, the punishment was, was inflicted of many. Woke them up. So that contrary wise, verse 7, you ought rather to forgive them. Oh, see, here's the next problem. I've seen this. A husband steps out into an affair or a wife steps out into an affair. And it used to be kind of like this, but honestly, it's really getting almost more even, sadly. But they step out into an affair. Is anybody in this room not wrapped in a meat suit? What do you mean? Flesh. Anybody not have flesh surrounding their body, their soul, their spirit? Which means none of us are immune. Someone steps out. They made a bad decision for whatever reason. They get caught up in an affair, he or she. Thankfully, eventually, they come to themselves. However, it gets revealed, discovered, whatever. They're truly broken. They're truly repentant. They really realize what they've done. And they pour everything they can into trying to find forgiveness and reconcile. And I have seen marriages reconcile from some pretty upsetting things. And thankfully, I've even had some in those reconciled marriages come and tell me our marriage is better now than it was before these things ever happened. Now, warning, hear my heart. I'm not saying, you know, to spice up your marriage, here's an idea. Why don't you run out, get an affair with that neighbor, and, uh, and then show up in my office and we'll sort it out. No! God forbid. But there was such brokenness, such repentance, such change that for the first time in their married life, they actually really had a relationship. That's the only reason why I still will sit with couples and others here will sit with couples who are in trouble because we've seen God actually do such a work of healing. But here's the hard part. 
So the wife whose husband steps out, he gets repentant, he comes back, she forgives him. Yes, there better be accountability and all that. Let's not be naive. But she forgives him, their marriage gets healed, they move forward. And yet there are people around them who say, well, I can't forgive him. Flip side, the husband whose wife missteps, she gets broken, she comes back, really repentant, really healed. Their marriage is like, wow, this is great. And there are people around them who say, well, I just can't forgive her for what she did to him. Hold on, the person who is most affected by this sin is willing to accept forgiveness, reconciliation, and see the relationship healed, and you won't? Anybody following this? That sounds like the older brother and the prodigal son. Somebody who got lost in something came back, they're broken, and you're like, mm-hmm, what have you done for me lately? That's another place I see things go sideways. But he'll cover that in a second. So, wherefore, I beseech you, you would confirm your love towards him. The guy repented, he came back, welcome him. For to this end, also, verse 9, I did write, this was the point, bring him to repentance, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye, the church at Corinth, be obedient in all things. So, having had this happened, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave it I in the person or on behalf of Christ. As his apostle, I can tell you this guy's repented and Jesus forgives him too. Lest Satan should get advantage of us. Well, that's odd. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Ooh. What does that mean? The same temptation that got the husband or wife to fall into sin. He'll not only destroy a marriage, kids, and extended family. He'll also use it to destroy a church. See, here's the thing. Satan loves collateral damage. He'll damage going on the way in. He'll damage on the way out. He'll get as much collateral damage out of any trial, any sin, any transgression as he possibly can. So here the marriage gets reconciled. But the people around them are still split and divided because even though the couple's extended forgiveness, the people around them refuse to. So now he's using unforgiveness by the surrounding people to still divide the relationships. I don't know, that's kind of far-fetched. Okay, let's test it. Name the first relationship Satan blew up. His with God's. Oh. Name the second relationship's he blew up the angelic realm that rebelled with him against God. Now, in the human realm, name the first relationship he blew up. Eve and then Adam's relationship, number one, with God and with each other. Keep playing this forward. What did he do to their children's relationships? Think mm, Cain and Abel. How many are now seeing the pattern? One of the ways Satan loves to do damage is destroy relationships. And if by the grace of God they recover themselves, then he'll use it the opposite way where people refuse to restore them even though the spouse restored the offender. You see, this is what he's talking to at Corinth. Like, listen, guys, there's a realm of darkness that we're dealing with, and he always comes along, and he tempts, and he deceives. And if it's you who got deceived, but you come to yourself, you wake up, and you come back, the answer should be, welcome home, not, oh, look who it is. I have all the time people like, yeah, I got away from the church, I got into college, I got whatever, and I got really messed up, but now I'm back. And I always say the same thing to them. <laughs> welcome home. Welcome home. Lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. He'll use sin, he'll use unforgiveness. You know, here's the thing. If, how do you get the measles? <coughs> how do you get the measles? <laughs> Contact tracing being around someone else who has it. In other words, you have to catch it in some fashion. You don't really get it until you catch it. How do you learn forgiveness? 
You don't really know how to ex extend forgiveness until you yourself have experienced forgiveness. And the place you experience forgiveness is when you surrender your life to God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I confess my need for you. I put my trust in Jesus. I believe his blood was shed for me. I believe he paid for my sins. And suddenly the peace of God comes into your life. We talked about it last week in Corinthians. He gives you the Holy Spirit. He seals you. His work of the Spirit comes upon you. And your life changes. And the people around you go, I don't really like where you're going to church. But i got to admit, you've changed. You don't curse like you used. In fact, you don't curse at all. And all these things that begin to change because you humbled yourself and asked God to come in. Nobody should be better at extending forgiveness than the church of Jesus Christ that has experienced God's forgiveness. And yet, sadly, sometimes where you find the least forgiving people are among God's people. And that's not the way it should be. So you can't give away what you don't have. You don't know what it's like to be forgiven until you surrender your life to Christ. Now, I know what you're thinking. Those who are visiting, how long is this guy going to go on? And what book was he in anyway? Mention like five of them. Well, the good news is we'll pick it up here next week. If you really aren't following at all, go back and listen to the first two chapters of 2 Corinthians. This book is an absolute gift to the church. He says out of this church, he's going to bring forth a chaste virgin for Christ. And he's going to reward them anyway. So maybe you came in, you're walking as good, is not as good as it should be. Maybe Thanksgiving was, you know, a train wreck. And you dragged yourself back to church saying, how could God love me? Are you kidding? Don't you know a father's heart? He's so happy you came home. Let's stand, let's pray.